Hello, everyone. This is Kelly Eversole. I'm the Executive Director of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium, or IWGSC. And I want to welcome you to our webinar series today. Today we have uh, Cristobal Wawi uh, joining us, who will be giving us a, a great presentation. But before we jump, <coughs> excuse me, jump into that, I'm going to give you a little bit of overview of the IWGSC and some of our activities. So the consortium is has members, uh, almost 3,000 members in 70 different com countries, and we have over 800 research institutes involved. Uh, the webinar is, has been made possible by our sponsors, uh, both uh, academic sponsors as well as our small and large companies, and uh, Kansas Wheat, which is one of the growers. The vision for the IWGSC as what we call IWGSC 2.0 post the high quality reference sequence is to enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. Some of our activities uh, right now include, uh, we're in the process of expanding the IWGSC Arbor Biosciences collaboration. We hope to have out very shortly uh, the IWGSC RefSec V2.0 and 2.1 with gap closure uh, from version one, as well as the manual and functional annotation uh, of those versions. And we are right now starting the IWGSC Wheat Diversity Project and hope to have reference sequences of at least eight land races that represent the entire breadth of wheat diversity. And we are, of course, trying to coordinate pre publication releases of genome sequences for elite wheat varieties and other uh, genomic resources. And then fortunately, we had planned uh, the IWGSC webinar series, <clears throat> and that's been very useful during the time of COVID. So just to let you know, our next scheduled webinar uh, is actually organized by the Phytobiomes Alliance. And uh, the title of that is Ensuring Food Safety and Security, Evaluating and Utilizing Plant Pest Pathogen Phytochemical Interactions. And this does include uh, work on cereals, so I encourage you to register for that. Uh, William Hay from the USDA ARS will be giving that presentation. So just let everyone know they're on your IWG, on the webinar dashboard, um, you will see a place for questions. Please use the Q&A panel for any questions, and there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can use the chat for talking with other attendees or even talking with the organizers, but please put your questions in the Q&A panel. You can already download both my presentation and Cristobal's presentation in, in the handouts area. And just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the IWGSC YouTube channel in a few days. And you can subscribe to that channel and never miss a, a new upload. So <clears throat> with this point, I'd like to turn it over to Cristobal Warwi, and uh, he's going to talk about a roadmap <clears throat> for gene functional characterization in wheat. Cristobal? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so welcome everyone. I'd like to start off by saying, uh, thanking um, Kelly and the organization for the opportunity to, to talk to you today. And what I'll try to do is try to give you a little bit of a, uh, of a walk through some of the developments that have happened in wheat and why they're really changing the landscape of what we can do um, in this um, such an important uh, crop. So I'll start off by saying that um, a lot of the interest that we have is to trying to link genotype and phenotype. Um, I think that 
most of the work that we all do is trying to solve this equation. And, and of course, sometimes we start with a very interesting phenotype and we try to work our way to understand what are the genes responsible for that. In other cases, we have a specific sequence and we want to understand what does this sequence do in terms of its phenotype. So I'm going to try to show you how uh, the new resource can allow us to, to address these questions. And it's really been remarkable what's happened over the last four or five years uh, in terms of the development in wheat genomics. And, and this is a slide or, or, or a figure from a paper that we published with Mike Bevan. It was a review in 2013. And we were saying, you know, it would be great that in the future we had all these different resources. But really, we didn't have very much. We, we could only dream of these possibilities. And then starting with the initial genome sequence in 2014, now all of a sudden we have a series of different uh, genomic resources that we can take advantage, be it uh, assemblies of Chinese spring, but also some of the progenitors of wild emmer, uh, improved assemblies recently published. And then you heard Sean Wachowiak talk from Curtis Posniak's uh, lab a few weeks ago on uh, the efforts for the pan genome. So really it's been a step change in terms of the, the genome sequence. But when we start looking at the different uh, features of this, we can see now that we have really good information about SNP variation, a lot of work in Edward Akunov's lab, and also some recent papers as well. Uh, thinking about copy number variation, that's something that now with um, long reads and better assemblies, we start getting access to, to this as well. In the case of the Alonje paper in, in Chinese Spring, and then in uh, the, the talk that um, Sean gave a few weeks ago in a whole set of different wheat cultivars. In terms of epigenetic status, uh, work by Anthony Hall and others, and then recently, paper in genome biology, which I'll mention later, tilling mutants, and now we can, we can uh, mine in silico, expression data, gene networks that we can then use to try to put some information uh, together. And of course, uh, a lot of the SNP data has then, and all of this information has then been put into uh, a whole series of databases that allow us to access the data and mine the data more uh, effectively. So this will include serial DB from Bristol, but of course also ensemble plants, grain genes, URGI, and so on. And, I'll, and I'll, you'll see I'll mention a lot of uh, ensemble plants because I think it has several features that, that, that allow us to combine information, not just from wheat, but also take information from other species. And that's why generally we, we, we've been using ensemble plants a lot. And from these tools, we can also build new resources like in the case of Polymarker, which I'll mention later. And I'd like to just pay homage um, to these five early career researchers um, from my lab, but also to uh, countless other researchers who have really been the people who, who have made this change possible in wheat. And in this case specifically, I want to just mention the five of them because as a lab, when we were trying to understand all this different information, how could we get access to it, which was the latest release, the latest assembly, the latest of this, they said, why don't we actually put our our knowledge together and try to get as much information as possible and make a website so that people can go and get the latest information. So thanks to them and also countless other contributors, uh, we developed this page called wheattraining.com. And wheattraining.com is a very simple website and its objective is to allow people who perhaps are not that familiar with wheat or who are entering into wheat to be able to go to a place to get hopefully updated information about uh, a lot of the references or a lot of the information in wheat. And, and it also includes information about just how to grow wheat, how to cross wheat, some very simple things that perhaps are, are not necessarily obvious when you're starting out. So we, we, we did this website and if you click, for example, on uh, one of the tabs, you can get then uh, the genome assemblies, you can get the gene models, so you can then click each one of these for more information. And the same thing, for example, for functional studies, you can also get uh, how to select mutants, how to use VIGs or transgenics, and a whole set of different strategies. So the website is hopefully an up-to-date version of this. And we received lots of feedback from the community on the website and on different elements of it. And this led us to put forward a, a, a review article in eLife last year that's kind of the title of, of, of this specific seminar, which is this Roadmap for Gene Functional Characterization. And in that, we, we, we developed a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a map of what are the things that we thought were important to consider if you started from with a gene sequence, for example, and try to understand what that gene sequence could be doing. And you'll notice that uh, in that map, we have a whole series of different uh, aspects that are related there that uh, you'll see here, genome assemblies, gene models, et cetera. And each one of these has a corresponding section on the wheattraining.com website. So if you want to find more about genome assemblies, 
just a section on that or how to find uh, your ortholog in wheat based on Arabidopsis, there's a section on that. So we try to provide um, specific sections on each one. And importantly, um, from the seminar, if there's any interest in people to contribute to this, please let us know. We'll be more than happy to update it, include new sections, and then everyone's name goes into the contributor section. So that way you can also claim it. You can put your logo of your university or institute, and that way it's a, it's a community resource. That's why it's, it's called wetraining.com without any specific university attachments at the end. So to start off, perhaps to say that one of the critical things is that we, we have a common nomenclature. And, and just to show the gene models and the importance of gene models, uh, that we had several iterations of gene models. And, and we have papers that are published with the CSS gene models or the TGAC gene models or the RefSeq version 1 gene models or the version 1.1 gene models. So, for example, here we just tried to make a very simple diagram to start saying what's in the name of all these different gene models? What does it mean uh, and how you can relate them? So that's one of the first things we started. And, and what I'll do in the presentation is that I'll show the, the small icons for the different, um, for example, here gene models as icon showing that there's a corresponding section in the wheattraining.com website. So having gene models that are stable has been really important because now we can talk the same language. And that's uh, really crucial when we're comparing studies that are done in Australia, in China, Japan, the UK, the US, Brazil, wherever, we have now the same nomenclature and we can talk the same language. And of course, having the RefSeq allows us then to also have the same, uh, the same map to work with. So for example, when we want to find, um, if we start from a Robidopsis gene or, or a rice gene, um, ensemble plants has a really good feature of these pre-computed gene trees. Um, and here we, we take advantage or we leverage the fact that Ensemble does not just have wheat, but has all the other species or many of the plant species that have been sequenced and annotated. So for example, we can start with an Arabidopsis gene, and then we just basically press on the gene trees and we end up with a gene tree that includes wheat. So we can rapidly have a look at uh, the genes in wheat, and we can see that we have three copies of this gene in wheat for the A, the B, and the D, but we also have the Triticum dicocoides, so the uh, Emmer genome sequenced by Asaf Distenfeld et al. Uh, as well, we have Triticum turgidum or the Durum wheat genome, we have Tausia, we have Urartu, and of course then we have Barley and Brachypodium that allow us to see if we have a complete tree or not. So very rapidly we can do this. We have to be always careful when, when doing this, and there's lots of little tricks that again are mentioned in the, in the training.com website to make sure that if you have a gene from another species that you find the correct set of, uh, of orthologs in wheat. But having this is a very rapid tool to be able to have a first approximation of how many genome copies you'll have and how many versions of the gene. And then a very simple question that, that, that we started asking with um, uh, people in my lab, especially with, with Philippa, who's now uh, independent at Birmingham and with Ricardo, was this very simple question of where my gene was expressed. So we had maybe perhaps uh, you did an analysis what, like this, and you might have two or three genes that could be possibly uh, orthologs of an Arabidopsis gene. So a question is, where's my gene expressed? And it was quite frustrating that there were thousands or let's say hundreds of RNA-seq data sets out there, but you really couldn't use them. Some people had aligned them to their own reference, some people had done their own um, assembly, some people had used the Chinese spring gene models, the original ones, the TGAC. So what we did is that we put this all together and we analyzed them in one go. And this is what came up to be the wheatexpression.com website. And by doing this now, we have over a thousand samples in this website, and you can choose which is, uh, gene models you want to use. So you want to uh, use uh, either the, the latest uh, version or maybe the TGAC gene models, depending on, on, on what you're, you're working on. You can select which studies that you, you want to display. You can blast your gene. So it gives you a very flexible manner to access these thousand RNA-6 data sets. And importantly, because they're analyzed in a way that's comparable, you can now start comparing across studies. So if you have a gene, that you do not know very much about, you can very rapidly leverage hundreds of thousands of pounds of RNA-seq data sets for your study within an afternoon. And you can look one gene at a time, or you can look, for example, at many genes at a time to get an idea of, of how this looks and get an initial approximation of where my gene is expressed, under which conditions, under stress or non-stress, and so on. We also worked with uh, uh, colleagues in Toronto with Nick Probart and his team to develop this uh, EFP browser. And the CFP browser was very nice because here we took advantage of um, one developmental time course that was RNA-seq data donated by uh, BioProp Science. And in that time, and here we took 70 tissue developmental stages. And you can very rapidly see if you put a gene model in here, you put a gene name, 
you can now see that, for example, in this case, this gene is expressed in roots uh, and during early root development, but also across the, the root developmental stages by, by looking at that color, the red color showing that. And it's actually quite low expressed in other tissues, in this case, apart from, from lemmas, for example. Um, there's more details about this in, again, in the wheattraining.com website. But importantly, you can very rapidly answer these questions that instead of having to do your own qPCR for your gene and make the genocidic primers and do all of that, you can very rapidly leverage these huge data sets uh, for your studies. And just to give you some examples of how people are using it, this is um, a study by Juan de Bernardi in Jorge Dukovsky's lab. And in this case, there were four orthologs that could be of interest based on the gene under, of the gene that was known in Rabidopsis. And very rapidly, they were looking at spike development. And they could see that actually two of these versions, the ones that flank the graph, are actually quite yellow, or they're actually not expressed uh, during spike development based on the browser. Two of them are. So perhaps those are the two that you would want to focus more for subsequent studies. And also uh, the study by Susan Schilling and Rainer Meltzer, who talked uh, a couple of weeks ago here, they've also used the same visualization platform to get a, an idea, for example, of which are the genes that are of interest, um, in this case, the match transcription factors. And interestingly, they also were able to then look in more detail to see that actually some of them uh, seem to be upregulated during a disease. So you can see here at the bottom, the bluish color, meaning that as in the infected tissue, you have upregulation of these genes and you don't have the same in mock. So all, all of a sudden you start uh, being able to look at, at uh, a deeper biological understanding. And especially for biotic stress, it's quite interesting because you might have a gene that you've studied in yellow rust, for example, and all of a sudden you can ask, well, is this gene also upregulated or differentially expressed under different conditions from other people? And you can then look at that and suddenly see if it has something to do with biotrophs or necrotrophs or more general disease resistance or stress. So it really allows you to amplify your conclusions uh, when you're doing this. Just to highlight here that all of this data is available. So all the analysis that was done is available in the, in the website, but Ricardo has done a really important job of making sure that all the source code, the visualization, and you can download the whole data set if you want to analyze it in a different manner, you can download it all uh, for your use. The only thing we do ask is that if you do use it, please uh, cite the papers rather than the website, because that's what uh, gets credit for Ricardo and Philippa who developed this, this resource. Some other resources that are very interesting that have emerged now are, for example, looking at epigenetic marks. So there was a very beautiful paper that was published uh, last year in Genome Biology from the lab of uh, Jining Zhang uh, by the first author, Ji Wan Li. And here they see you can actually uh, look at, in this case, seedlings, and they've done a whole set of uh, different chip experiments and also uh, DNA hypersensitive sites. So you can now go for your gene of interest and you can have very rapidly an idea of, at least in seedlings, where do you have open chromatin? What is the different chromatin marks that are available in that gene? And again, there's already data that's, that, that's there. And this is really uh, a step change from where we were you know, just you know, a few years ago. Importantly for us is that um, for a long time, we've relied, let's say, on Arabidopsis to try to understand wheat. And I think that it was very important for us to now make the, the, the move to be able to understand wheat for itself, let's say, to actually be able to um, uh, study the functions of genes in wheat. Um, and that's important because when we compare uh, Arabidopsis to wheat in terms of its evolutionary, evolutionary divergence, it's equivalent to comparing a platypus with, with humans. So actually there's a huge uh, evolutionary divide. And when we try to make conclusions based on Arabidopsis, we have to be very careful if they actually translate to wheat. So now the fascinating thing is that we can actually do these studies in wheat itself. And this is a project that we started many years ago, and it was with the vision of, can we actually generate mutations in every wheat gene? And, and this started with a project of very simple mutagenesis, something that's been done since the you know, late uh, 1920s in wheat. So take seed, put them in a chemical EMS, and you get a population of mutants. And of course, you can then collect seeds of those mutants and the DNA. And we took great care that the seeds were all very nice and clean, and we deposited them in a public repository. And then we took the DNA. And then technology allowed us to now all of a sudden take the next step, which was actually to sequence uh, the DNA of these plants. It was too much to sequence uh, the whole genome, but we used exome capture. So we were able to focus on the, on the exonic regions of the, of the genome and then basically do mutant identification. Um, I'm calling this or I'm saying this very, very quickly, but this is many years of many people's lives. And this was led by uh, Senia Krasileva, uh, originally at UC Davis, then at Erlam as a partner next to, to us at John Innes, and then she's now independently uh, working at Berkeley, of course. 
uh, with Jorge and with Andy Phillips uh, as well. And it was a, a huge effort that led us to now have this collection of mutants and working with Ensemble, we've now uh, put them all in Ensemble so that you can rapidly access over 10 million weak mutants online. So that means that with your gene model, and again, the importance of having a, a consistent gene model, you can go to Ensemble Plants, click on a little button that says find my mutants, and you get a picture like this or a table. And you can rapidly see that in this case, there's many mutations in this gene. And for example, this, this one that looks red here means there's a cue that has uh, mutated to a stop codon. If you click on that, then you can, it'll take you to a website where you can order the seeds and literally within a couple of days, you can be studying that mutation in that gene in wheat itself. So it's really a step change in terms of how we can do this work. And, and again, I'd like to highlight here the work of Bruno Contreras, Guy Namati, and Dan Bolser, who have been fantastic at Ensemble Plants to really push the team to make things available for wheat and, and for polyploids and actually adapt the platform uh, to, to be able to use it. And that's something that perhaps is often uh, not recognize all the work that goes behind generating these resources, but not also that, but actually making them visually uh, easy for people to use, especially if you don't have all the bioinformatics skills, like many of us, including myself, I say. So in this case, we can now rapidly go into Ensemble, find the mutations, and all of that takes a huge amount of work. It's usually not very glamorous, but it's so essential. So I just want to highlight the great work that they do uh, for the wheat community. So now we, we, we have this information and we want to now study the biology. And of course, a lot of the phenotypes that we're interested in uh, are, are, are usually complex, meaning that uh, there's not just a single gene that controls the trait, but there's multiple genes that will control this trait, such as uh, yield or nutritional value. And this means that many of these traits will not be presence absence traits. Uh, they're not resistance susceptible traits, but actually they have a continuous phenotypic variation meaning that changes in one gene perhaps will lead to a shift across this gradient rather than from a jump from one end to the other. So we can get this continuous variation and mutations in individual genes shift us along this gradient. But of course the challenge is that this is in a diploid case, but what happens when you have polyploids like many of these important species and of course wheat? In this case, we still have multiple genes that control these complex traits, but at the same time we have multiple copies of every gene. In this case, the A, the B, and the D genome for, for bread wheat. So that leads us to functional redundancy. So if we look at that same scale above, it's already complicated, but now we have three extra copies, let's say. So now you need to imagine that now that gradient becomes even more, um, even more cut. So now mutations perhaps in a single gene will lead to very, very, very subtle variations. And hence, it's important that we combine mutations so we can actually overcome that functional redundancy of the different homologs um, in the case of polyploid wheat. So it was really important to also start thinking about how can we combine mutations to get full knockouts of the genes. So if you have a mutation in the A genome and the B genome, how can we accelerate the ways that we can make double mutants or triple mutants? And that's why when we developed the tilling populations, we did it in a cultivar called Cadenza, which is a UK uh, facultative wheat, and also in Cronos, which is a California uh, Durham wheat variety. And Kronos has the advantage that because it's tetraploid, you can find mutations in the A and the B genome, and within one cross, you can generate a double mutant in the F2 surrogating population. And you can, of course, select them. And in the hexaploid within Cadenza, you need to generate one additional cross to be able to combine the three homologs. So we worked with Ricardo, and he developed this very clever tool called Polymarker, and was able to generate genome-specific cast bars for the majority of those 10 million mutations. So hence, when you go to Ensemble Plants, you find your mutation, you also have cast markers that are associated with those mutations, so you can select them when you're doing your crossing and when you're, you're confirming them, when you're doing your crossing, and in the F2 to select your double mutants and your double uh, wild types, let's say. I want to add here, it's really important that because of the mutation density we have, it's really important that you consider the background mutations as well. And there's a whole set of strategies that are discussed in the Tilling website and in some other papers that we've written about how to use strategies to make best use of the Tilling population and being careful with possible background mutations. So that's really important to just consider that it's not just getting one mutant and that's it. It's important to have additional mutants, independent mutants, and also to do the genetics to be sure that you don't have background mutations that might be affecting your trait. And of course, when we were doing this, uh, again, a very nice case of international collaboration, um, 
speed breeding came along. So with Brand the Wolf, we went to the International Wheat Congress uh, in Sydney several years ago, and Lee Hickey was talking about this fantastic thing called speed breeding. And then Brandon contacted him afterwards, and, and Lee was very open and you know gave all the protocols so we could actually adopt speed breeding at, at John Innes. And, and it's really revolutionary in terms of, for example, taking Cadenza, which is our, our, our parent of our tilling population and a very important UK line, you can see that under normal growth, we have a certain growth stage at 38 days. And under the speed breeding conditions, we now have plants that are fully flowering by that stage. So just to highlight that, in addition to, of course, Lee and, and Brande, uh, very important to this was Amy Watson and Shreya Ghosh as early career researchers to, to generate this, this, this knowledge and to uh, publish that, that article that, that, that most people are now using uh, for, for their research. So this means that now we can use speed breeding to also accelerate the generation of double mutants or triple mutants for our work. And you can see here that in this case, well, now we can get double mutants for the Kronos population, the tetraploid population, within six to eight months. So we can now study the phenotype relatively quickly. And that really is a game changer. And, and importantly now, uh, although I won't discuss here the technologies in terms of, of new transformation technologies and CRISPR and so on, that's I think topic for an another, uh, another seminar perhaps, um, just to say that I think they're very complementary uh, approaches. Um, it's very hard to do perhaps transgenic on five or six genes, whereas with the tilling, you can order the seeds and get moving straight away. And each one has its merits and demerits. But I think they're very complementary, and at least in the lab, we use them in that manner uh, to be able to use both. But again, the tilling populations are all completely um, available. You can order them through the seed store at John Innes and also through Jorge's lab in Davis. Uh, and there's phytosanitaries ready for many parts of the world, so you can order them. Um, without any problem. So let's put this to test now. So one of the, the, the things that we're working on was, uh, was grain size. And it's quite frustrating when you look at the effects of QTLs in wheat compared to rice or other diploids. So this graph uh, is something that Jemima prepared as part of a review that we published a couple of years ago. And I was looking, if you take all the QTL studies in rice that have then developed near isogenic lines, when you compare those neuroisogenic lines, what is the phenotypic difference between those nils? And you can see here that in rice, there's a whole set of reports, but it usually ranges around 25%, you know, with, with some outliers here, you know, and, and, and the minimum value that anyone would dare report in rice would be a 10% difference because that's kind of, you know, the lowest you would say for, for 1,000 kernel weight. And you can see length and, and, and width of the grain, you know, 20% differences in the nils. And if you look at, at similar studies in wheat with neuroisogenic lines for a QTL, you see that there the effect is about 5% per 1,000 kernel weight, and no one has ever reported anything over 10, which is something that you wouldn't even report in rice. So that it's, it's massively different, and it's quite frustrating. But now with the tools, we can now start combining mutations to see if by combining mutations across these candidate genes, can we actually get generate these larger phenotypic effects? So we took upon this work, um, work by James Simmons in the lab, but also with Wei Wang in Edward Akunov's lab in Kansas State, they did it through uh, CRISPR, we did it through tilling, and we got very, very similar results. And this just shows how, in this case, for this gene called GW2, you can see that the wild type version has three copies, and this is a gene that's a, a negative regulator of grain size. And you can see that if we make a single mutant, you get a you know five to six percent difference in the width of the grain or the, uh, the thousand kernel weight of the grain, similar to what I showed you before. But of course, when you combine the mutations, now all of a sudden you get a 21% increase with the triple mutant. So now we know that this potential is there in wheat, but because of the way that wheat works and because these mutations are recessive, it's very hard to actually get a triple recessive mutant that gives you the 21%. So breeders have been playing with 6%, but importantly, with these genomic tools, we can now see that the potential is there in wheat, it's just hiding. And now the question is that how do we use these tools to uncover that variation and take full advantage of the polyploid potential of wheat. So I'll now change a little bit to from induced mutations also to natural variation. So of course, within the cereals, we have lots of variation. This is just, I put it here because I think it's a beautiful picture, but also because in wheat, of course, we also have a lot of variation. So part of the things that we organized in, in, the, in the review, in the eLife review and in the website are natural populations that, uh, or populations that have natural diversity. So this is just highlighting one of them, the Watkins population, and, and the table two in the, in the eLife paper has an idea of a, a short description, how many accessions, and these are all accessions or, or populations that have been genotyped and that have seed available, and, and there's papers and so on. 
Um, and just another one to, to exemplify is a population developed uh, by NIAB. This is Keith Gardner and James Cochran and also Ian Mackay. And this is uh, magic populations with eight parents or 16 parents. And again, 100 large populations with 600 or 1,000 reels. And these have all been genotyped with 35K axiom array. It's published, it's available, and you can order the seeds to study the traits you want. And this is just two populations of a series of populations that are documented in the web page, but also in table two in the ELAC paper. And it's really, really fascinating. And these populations, just to show you, you can, for example, go to Seed Store, which is the germplasm uh, uh, resource unit at John Innes. And you can see here that we have the collections, for example, the wheat tilling population is all there, so you can order the mutants directly. The pan genome collection, so all the varieties that have been sequenced as part of the pan genome or the 10 week genome project that Sean uh, or Kowiak talked a few weeks ago are available there. Uh, we have treaty say genome panels, we have deletion lines of Paragon or neurosogenic lines, and so on. Um, and I'll mention a little bit uh, this one here the, the, the nested association panel. So I mentioned the Watkins population, and the Watkins is a population of land races that was put together in the 1920s and 1930s by uh, Watkins in the, in, in, in the UK government. And then Simon Griffiths took it on board about 10 years ago to really clean up the population, make single city descents, and really make them homogeneous. A huge amount of work to get it to a position where working with colleagues like Simon Orford and Lucy Vingen, they were then to start genotyping these populations, finding certain structures, and then starting to characterize them. Importantly, within this Designing Future Wheat program in the UK, Simon has led the development of a nested association mapping population. So 100 different Watkins have been crossed to one common parent that's called Paragon, which is also one of the lines that has been sequenced as part of the 10 Week Genome Project. In this case, we have that, we have over, at the moment now, there's over 100 populations. These are F6 populations that are off the shelf, meaning that if you want to order it, you can go to the website and say, I want to order the population of Paragon, again, Watkins number 55, and then you can get the population. They have skeleton maps of about 200 cast assays that are already available. And actually many of these have been phenotyped already. So it's a hugely rich resource that Simon and his team have developed that we can now access. So this just shows you the potential of using now these resources for your uh, scientific question. And I'd like to give you one example um, of, a, of, a nice, of a really nice study, I think, that came out of Scott Bowden's lab with colleagues at CSIRO and at John Innes and also Laura Dixon, who is now uh, as an independent researcher at, at Leeds. And here they found a, 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 a natural allele uh, for this paired spikelet phenotype, and they found this in the four-way magic population from CSIRO, which is also described in, in, in the website. And what they said is that, well, they were able to do mapping and find um, a, a narrow genetic interval that had an interesting candidate gene. So what they did is that they took this gene and they used tilling mutants to show that, in fact, it was the Teosinte branch gene, the D genome copy of the gene by using the tilling mutants. They then did functional studies by making transgenic lines with Fielder, which again, I won't talk about transgenics, but it's also in the website with a little bit more information with some of the recent protocols developed at John Innes by Sadia Haite, which are publicly available and are very high efficient in addition to, of course, more proprietary methods like Japan Tobacco. But then Scott and, and, and Laura were able then to identify natural variation in, this, in these TB alleles, the, the A, uh, the B and the D genome copy. And very interestingly, then they went into the UK population. So they're into that magic population from NIAB, which I mentioned before. And they used the NIAB eight-way magic population, and they were able to find that in the UK, they also got a very strong hit for uh, the, the Telsinter branch gene for paired spiked. But interestingly, instead of being the D genome, which is the one they found that was affecting the population at uh, in Australia, the CSIRO population, they found that in the UK, it was actually the B genome copy that was affecting the trade. So now you go from fundamental understanding, but also really important value for breeders. And this is, I think, is a really nice example of how using the multiple tools, you can really take advantage. Scott did not develop the magic population here. He did not develop the tilling, but actually he was able to take advantage of them. And that's, all these populations are there with the hope that people use them and take advantage of them to advance scientific discovery. And hopefully they also benefit and generate new alleles or new understanding for breeders. Along those lines, it's quite hard sometimes to put all this information together. Uh, there's so much data now. And uh, work by colleagues at Rothamsted, led by Kiwan Hassani Pak, have been really important to generate what, what he calls uh, the K-net miner, 
which is which are knowledge networks. So in this case, you can now leverage information by having a gene model from wheat. You can now find what is the gene model in Arabidopsis in this case, which is this gene here. This is the wheat gene, the proteins linking them with rice and then to Arabidopsis. And now he's able now to say, well, all of these papers talk about the effect of this gene in response to heat and so on and so forth. And you can see these two hybrid interactions, the paper that describes them. So now you can go into wheat and say, well, what do we know about wheat? And before you would have said, well, we know nothing about wheat. We only know that it's an orthologue of this gene in Arabidopsis. But actually now we know that in the case of wheat, there's actually networks that have been developed uh, as part of the transcriptome data. And now, for example, here, you know, this gene is part of a uh, expression co-expression module. And this co-expression module is enriched for uh, processes related to stress or cell death, abiotic stimulus, suggesting that perhaps the function we might be conserved given what we know of the gene in Arabidopsis. So now you can start testing hypotheses based on Arabidopsis in wheat itself. But it's not just based on like just Arabidopsis orthology, it's based actually on wheat information. For example, I showed you the, the modules here or also expression data. So this tool again is something that you have to be very careful that it's not just about putting a gene in and you get all the information you want. It's about understanding the tool and working with it like any new tool that you would use. So I really suggest that you uh, have a play with NetMiner because it really is a fascinating tool that, that encompasses all, a lot of these resources. And of course, they also link here, you can see here with the tilling mutants, these are all different mutations that lead to stop codons. So again, you click here and it will take you to the seed store or it will take you to ensemble plants. So these are all being linked to be sure that it, there's, a, there's a good user experience for this. Quite importantly, Chinese spring was really a, a landmark um, a sequencing, but of course, we don't grow Chinese spring. We grow other type of varieties. So it's very important that we also use that knowledge from Chinese spring to now kind of build upon and understand some of the cultivars that are currently grown across the world. And this effort has been catapulted by the 10 plus genome project and really spearheaded by Kurtis Kostnik at Saskatchewan. Uh, and it's been really, really successful. All of this data, again, I'll show you is, is now publicly available. So the lines that have been sequenced are varieties from all parts of the world with, with collaborators from Australia, Canada, the UK, and so on. Um, there's a lot of varieties that are bread wheat, and there's also some durum wheat and also emmer wheat. And, and the durum wheat has been published separately uh, by uh, Luigi Catibelli, Roberto Tuberosa, and Marco Macaferri's groups. Uh, and of course, Savitan is the wild emmer by, by Asaf. Um, but in this case, what you can see here is that uh, many of these varieties have been sequenced with the same technology that was used for um, the case of the IWC RefSeq, so the NRG in the Novo Magic. And then Sean Wachowiak would have talked about this, and he's leading the paper describing this. But also just to highlight that uh, a lot of the UK and SMIT varieties were uh, sequenced and assembled with a different algorithm, with the RAP2, that was developed by Bernardo Clavijo at the Erlen Institute. And then those two things have been put together and are now part of the pangenome paper that's currently under review, that, again, that, that Sean talked about a few, a few weeks ago. Importantly, all this information is available now, so you can actually go and blast this information, or you can download the sequence and use it under the Toronto Agreement. And again, importantly, all of this is being linked back to ensemble plants to be sure that when you are trying to work on these, uh, on these new varieties, you can actually do it very seamlessly through ensemble plants, through that interface. And that's why I, I've been highlighting ensemble plants and the efforts they've done to really be sure that now, as soon as the genomes are published as part of the paper, that also they're accessible through their platform. So very rapidly, we'll be able to, to say, this is my gene in Chinese spring, this, all the natural variation, at least in these varieties, in these different cultivars. So it's really exciting now what we will be able to do. And these are really very important varieties uh, from all across the world. And just to also highlight uh, another cool study that I saw a few weeks ago, which is a study done by Fei Lu and the Chinese Academy of Science. So um, Fei actually went not just within cultivated wheat, but he went across agilob species and sequenced 25 different triticum and agilob species, and it's in BioArca right now. So just to show you that there's many studies now that will be accessing natural variation to complement uh, the variation that we have in these sequence uh, cultivars. And importantly, of course, the sequence cultivars uh, from the 10 Genome Project are assembled to a chromosome level for most cases. So I'd like to finish off by showing you an example of how we're using the pan genome um, to, to do different things. Sean would have talked several things, but I want to show you a little bit about the work that we're doing in the lab. And this has been work that's been led by Jemima Brinton and Ricardo Ramirez Gonzalez. So this is using the wheat pan genome to define haplotypes and to define which regions of the genome are shared between cultivars. 
So in this case, we are comparing Mace and Stanley, so two varieties that were assembled and sequenced as part of the 10 Week Genome Project. And what you can see here is that when you do BLAST and or compare across specific regions, you can see that the sequence identity of regions, you can see here that the alignments that fall in, let's say, in this region here are about 99.93%. So they have about seven SNPs and 10,000 bases. So they really are not identical by state. They really are not the same sequence. Those seven SNPs are actually important. Um, but you can see other regions that you go from this kind of a slightly lower uh, sequence uh, similarity, and then you jump up to this almost 100% sequence similarity. There's a little jump down, but then again, you jump up to 99.99, almost 9% similarity. So you have maybe one SNP in 50,000 bases, and that actually is now something that is identical by state. So they were actually the same sequence that was bred into two different cultivars. And we can now start seeing which region spears have selected in different parts of the world. And in this case, what, what we can now do is we can use this information to call haplotype blocks. And we can now see, for example, here, Mace and Stanley, we're able to find five different haplotype blocks, again, in, within chromosome 6A, which means that they actually have sequence that's 100% identical between Mace and Stanley in these five regions. And of course, you can do, do these, all these pairwise comparisons to start learning which regions are conserved in which varieties and which regions are different. And of course, this is a very important tool to be able to identify which are regions that perhaps have new variation that's not currently in the germplasm set. So by doing this systematically, each variety one at a time and comparing them, I'm not gonna show you all the details, but you can actually become, you know, it's quite complicated when you compare them all pairwise, but you end up with a picture that looks like this. So we can define haplotypes across all the cultivars in this chromosome 6A. So for example, in this case, we two cultivars, Cadence and Paragon. These are UK cultivars that have a common parent and you can see here that most of the chromosome has the same color, meaning that the sequences are 100% identical. So in this case, over 90% of the chromosome of Cadenza and Paragon is identical by state. Another variety called Lancer, in this case from Australia, also has a lot of sequences that's similar. All the colors that are teal are identical by state to Paragon, but then here in the purple, only Cadenza and Paragon are the same and Lancer becomes different. Another variety, Robigus, from the UK, it's actually quite different. It has haplotypes are very different to Cadenza, Paragon, and Lancer. And other varieties like Matis are quite interesting. So Matis seems to have a hybrid, it's a mixture between the two. Some regions similar to Lancer, like this one here, some similar to Robigus, again, similar to Lancer, recombination back to Robigus, recombination back to Lancer. And you can now start seeing how it really is a jigsaw puzzle of these different haplotypes that are being combined by breeders. And we can see which haplotypes can recombine, which haplotypes are not recombining, how big the blocks are. And that's really important because at the end, these haplotypes are the units that breeders are selecting in their breeding programs. So if you fill out all the, all the varieties of the 10 Week Genome Project, you get a pot pre that looks like this. You get a, a map that looks like this. And now we've generated this for all the different chromosomes. And Ricardo has now generated, working with Jemima, this visualization interface that I'm happy to say that we now have live uh, since uh, this morning. So it was almost ready and now it's live thanks to the work by lots of people to, to get it there. So this is an example of the, of the interface. And what you see here is that these are the haplotype blocks. Anything that has the same color means that they're identical by state. Anything that has gray means that it's different to any other thing. So there's no pairwise things that are the same. And then at the bottom here, you actually see exactly the coordinates of where those blocks are. So you can highlight them and, and click on them. So I'll show you just a very quick, um, demonstration of how it looks uh, when you when you play with it. So in this case, you can see here that I'm, I'm moving across. And as you move across, it'll highlight the different blocks that you're standing on. So you can see which two blocks are similar between varieties, right? I can then also go to say, let's highlight Jagger. I only want to look at Jagger. What is similar to Jagger? So by clicking on Jagger, I can now have a look and see which regions are identical by state to Jagger. You can see here. Uh, I'm going to focus now on the beginning of chromosome 4B where RHT is. And if I move across, you can see that when I go to 31 million bases and click, I can now see that these six varieties share the same RHT allele. These two share the same RHT allele. And then these last two varieties, Cadenza and Mace, share the same RHTB alleles. So now all of a sudden now, we can see that we don't have actually 15 different sequences. We have, in this case, six varieties that have the same sequence for a big chunk of the genome from RHTB1B in this case, that are very identical by state. We have two varieties that have another RHT allele, two varieties have another. And all of a sudden now we can start making a problem. They're not 15 different varieties. 
there are actually perhaps three or four different haplotypes for that specific region. And I, I, I ask that you please use the website. There's still it's still under development, but if you have any questions or suggestions, we'd be more than happy to incorporate them uh, as we improve the, the the visualization. So just some concluding thoughts before we open up to questions. Um, I think it's really important that we, you know, that what we've done as a community is really outstanding, and and hopefully we can continue to be very open and provide open access resources to enable biological understanding. It shouldn't be that those who have access to the resources can then take advantage. It should be that those who have are able to make the resources and have the privilege to have funding to help with that, that make them available for the community to enable biological understanding. We need, the mission is not here to get the highest paper. The mission here is to feed the world and we can't forget that. I also want to say that polyploidy hides useful phenotypic variation. I think that we have a huge opportunity as a weed community to take advantage of genomics to really go after some traits that have been very difficult or very subtle in terms of the variation. And by looking, combining variation across homologs or finding dominant mutations, I think we'll be able to open up variation that breeders and natural selection has not been able to see before. Please be collaborative and open. And just to say that if you need more information or you want more information, it's all on the weed training website and also in the eLife paper. Um, just to say that it's also not just about wheat diversity, it's about human diversity. Um, thanks to all the funders. And before finishing that, just to say that there's also a very exciting meeting that I'm co-organizing with, with colleagues um, from the US and Europe. It's called this Plant Genomes in a Changing Environment. Fantastic speakers, really nice setup, but I just want to highlight the cost for students and importantly for low and middle income countries. So this includes many African countries, countries in South America, China, India, all of these delegates who come from low and middle income countries just need to send their CV and fill out a little form and they have a special bursary basically that it costs zero pounds to sign up to this workshop. It will be run for three afternoons from the 12th to 14th of October. We fought really hard to make sure that low and middle income country delegates would be free. So please take advantage of it and overwhelm them by signing up to this workshop. And it's really, really exciting science. And with that, just left to thank uh, everyone for their attention and happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Cristobal. It was a fabulous uh, presentation. We do have a number of questions uh, that have come in. And just to remind everyone, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, section of the, uh, of the desktop or the, your, your dashboard. All right, the first question is the TGAC version one assembly had many issues with the gene models and two papers were published based on those gene model results. <clears throat> what do you recommend as the best way for the correct gene model for any particular person's gene of interest? I would say definitely um, from the CSS to the TGAC, there was a really a step change in, in terms of the, of the quality and importantly, uh, the people who developed the TGAC also worked with the people who developed then the RefSeq to come up with a uni unified gene model. So again, that was a really important effort that was done to ensure that we wouldn't have two competing gene models. So the TGAC gene models were a really important step. And then from there, the RefSeq version, let's say 1.1 or the version two gene models, those are really the ones that we should be using at this moment as, as the really gold standard. They're not perfect, of course, there will be improvements. Uh, there's caveats with respect to alternative splicing because the programs that we're used to run these are not um, trying to find all the different variants, but it's an important step, step forward. And I'm sure that if we incorporate long read technology, those will improve. But RefSeq 1.1 or the TRIAS CS02G is what you should be using at this moment. Great. Uh, can you briefly describe a little bit more about the polymarker and how it can be used for weed improvement programs? So polymarker is, it does basically what anyone does in their computer, which would be blast against the genome, find the homologue for the A, the B, and the D, do a multiple alignment, find the homologue specific SNPs that would be used to make a marker specific for the A genome or the B genome or the D genome. So it does exactly that. And then it will make the cast marker with the SNP at the end, like you normally would, the two primers with the tails and the reverse primer, let's say, or the other, the third primer, will have a homolog specific SNP that will make that assay specific for the A genome or the B or the D, depending on what you want to target. And Ricardo has now updated this to include also the Svebo genome and uh, uh, Sabitan and also many of the pangenome varieties. So you can actually design primers specifically in Cadenza or Kronos or Svivo 
So uh, the tool is, is, is being updated also for the others. So that's something that's that's ongoing. And just to point out, there's a very nice review in or a paper in TAG uh, by Rod Snowden's group that talks about designing genome specific primers. Uh, but that's when you really are interested. Polymarkers, when you're really going for several markers, some might fail, but the majority do work in a homodoc specific manner. All right, great. Um, just a quick question. I think you covered this. Uh, how many wheat genotypes are actually included in the uh, pan genome? I think there's 15, <clears throat> 10 of which are chromosome level assemblies, meaning they're at the same quality as the Chinese spring assembly. And then there's the other five, which are 4UK and uh, Weibo, which is a cement variety. that are not to that level, but they're extremely contiguous as well compared to, to anything that we've seen. So uh, they're used as complementary, but there's 10 chromosome level and five very good scaffold level assemblies of the UK and the cement variety. And there's more coming as well, so. Right, all right. Um, the next one is that, is there any published case studies of genes not in the identified blocks functionally making the difference between a variety, one variety and another variety? That are not identified where in there? In uh, identified blocks. Ah, so for example, well, the haplotype blocks that we looked at would be, you would only recover something as being a block if it's shared between two accessions. So if, or two cultivars, if it's not in two cultivars, it will appear as a, as a gray color in, in, that, in that diagram. So there will be a lot of things that will appear like that. So if you have it in at least two, you will see it. If you have it only in one accession, you will not see it and it will come up as being something different. So that, that you will see it like that rather than seeing it as something, you know, you won't see any, any value in it right away. You'll see that that's something different. And of course, then the effort is, how do we then assign a phenotypic value to it? And that's of course um, the next question. I think one, one very simple way of thinking about it is that if you have a mapping population or a QTL study where you have your two parents and all of a sudden you have a region of interest and you say, well, I know the gene is between here and here and there might be you know, a big chunk of DNA with hundreds of genes. Well, if you can actually see if any of the haplotypes that are present in the sequence varieties are the same as the haplotypes that you have in your study, all of a sudden you have a complete genome assembly of your variety. It doesn't matter that it's not the same variety. As long as it's the same haplotype, it, you have the whole sequence. So that allows you to really rapidly uh, generate markers and actually find any candidate genes and so on. So there's many ways of using the, the haplotype and we just need to get used to how to access that information and use it because it's a very valuable data set to use, even if you're not using those exact varieties that were sequenced. Right. Um, are the bioinformatic tools that you mentioned, and I assume this means the ones that you've listed as well as the ones at Ensemble uh, connected to NCBI? Yeah, so the, at least all the gene names will be connected, but in terms of NCBI, there's NCBI, I don't know if it has that many tools. So there are some tools about expression, uh, but I think that through Ensemble Plants is probably the best way you can access many of these tools. Uh, and again, the gene model is what links everything. So uh, from Knet minor or from Net minor, the gene model connects you. From the tilling, based on the gene model, that connects you to Ensemble Plants. So, and now of course with the pan genome, um, it, they've done whole genome assembly or alignments to actually be able to see which regions are are similar. So there's been a lot of effort. I think Ensemble Plants is probably where you want to go rather than NCBI as a repository. Right. Um, <clears throat> did you test aphids on any of those lines? Aphids, no. But there's people at Rothamsted uh, and and uh, Gia Radotir, who's now just moved to Nyab, who's done uh, studies on aphids in some of these Watkins lines and other lines. But again, um, that's something that, you know, if you just request the seeds or send an email around to the people who develop it, they will know what phenotypes have, have been done and they're more than happy. I mean, the seeds are available. You can ask for them. The genotypes are available and so on. So you can really take advantage of those resources uh, to do your studies. And of course, what will be resistant for aphids in the UK might be very different to what's resistant to aphids perhaps in Australia, India and elsewhere. Right. So how far can you zoom in with the crop haplotype browser, can you get all the way to the gene level? Ah, good question. So the blocks that we call that are um, the default blocks are five megabase blocks. Um, you can go down to one megabase blocks and we feel quite confident with that. But then once you go below one megabase blocks, then it gets difficult to be able to see because what happens is that you're now talking about perhaps 10 SNPs that are differentiating. So you have to be very certain that something is similar or not similar. And of course, 
when even if you have things that are identical by state that are really identical, there will be sequencing errors. So you need to kind of address that as well. So you're kind of in that border between sequencing errors and biological variation where you have, you know, if you go to 10 KB, you don't have enough information. Everything looks the same because it might be 99.9, .9, it looks the same. So one megabase is where we are at the moment and that's available through the website. And then Ricardo is now working to be able to link when the data is in Ensemble Plan so you can click on one of those uh, uh, sections and it will take you then to Ensemble Plans to the sequence between those coordinates. So we're trying to make those links. We can't do them just now because the Ensemble Plans is not ready yet. It's kind of waiting until the paper is published. But those are the connections that we will make. But those are really good ideas that it will be great if, you, if people send them across so we can then incorporate them as we improve our releases. Great. Um, which generation of mutants did you consider to study expression analysis of target genes? And in particular, which generation would show stable phenotype? Okay, that will depend on the phenotype. So, for example, some phenotypes are very strong. Let's say uh, if you're doing disease resistance, you can, you, can, you can look at the F2 and you will see if the plant is resistant or susceptible. It, it's a pretty black and white response. Other traits, if you're looking at yield components and so on, will require more back crossing and more cleaning up uh, of the work. So, for example, in the lines I showed with the, uh, the tilling for this GW2 gene, that, that they had several back crosses. Importantly, when you cross independent mutants, they also have different mutations. So, in a way, you are back crossing a little bit, but you have to be very careful not to, uh, to go too early especially for the traits that you know are more complicated because those background mutations will affect you. And that's why it's always important to select both the homozygous wild type double wild type and the homozygous double wild type mutant. So that way you can then, that's the comparison. You don't compare to chronos or cadenza, you compare to your F2 homozygous. And normally what we'll do is that we'll take that, we perhaps will do two more back crosses, a back cross two, open the F2 and then select that. And then that, that way we feel pretty good. But of course you also have the other way of selecting making two independent crosses from two different set of mutations. And therefore then if you have the phenotype, then you feel pretty confident that it's not a background mutation because you have two independent mutants that are being crossed. Um, and we discussed some of those strategies in one of the reviews that's there, that's uh, the, the review by Brandon Wolf, Jorge Vukoski and myself in annual reviews of genetics. We discussed that a lot, but it's also in the, in the training website about how different ways to do it. But there's not like one clear way of doing it. It will depend on your phenotype and how much you trust it. All right, well, this is this will be a good one for you. Do you think that there's enough diversity in wheat? Yes, I do think there's enough diversity. And I think that it's now a matter of finding it, trying to understand it and combining it. As I said, for me, that the, the results with the GW2 and with other work that other people have done, when you start combining mutations, you see phenotypes that you have never seen in nature. You've never seen 21% from near isogenic lines and grains. As you just don't see it. Uh, you see this 5%. The potential is there, but you need to make these very clever crosses to, to be able to combine them. Now we have the genome, now we have the tools to do it. And I think that we're gonna be discovering that. That doesn't mean that that's gonna increase yield by 21%, for sure not. When you actually grow those plants, they compensate for other traits. However, the important thing is that now you can start separating things. Um, it was quite frustrating when you work on something like 5% that you're kind of at the same error rate that you have in the field. So you never know if it's related to the trait or not. Well, in this case, we increase 20% the grain and the plant doesn't increase yield. Okay, we know it's compensating and we can then tell that because it compensates with grain number and so on. Uh, as opposed to before with 5%, it was very difficult to know 1%, 2%, maybe, maybe not. So, but I think there is enough diversity. We just need to un un unleash it. But also, of course, with genome editing and other tools, it will be, it will be really exciting now. Do you still see a, a role for synthetics? Yes, for sure, for sure. The D genome clearly has uh, less diversity. Uh, we, you know, we're all aware of that. And then the examples of, of SIMIT and the synthetics that have come, come through uh, are a clear example. It would be very interesting, I think, to do the haplotype work with the synthetics to be sure to, to understand which synthetics have made it through and also which set of gene pools have not been taken advantage. And, and again, as part of this germplasm set that I mentioned, uh, NIAB uh, through Alice and Bentley are leading a huge uh, resynthesis effort and now there's 50 different synthetics that were complementary to the ones that were developed originally at Kansas State and CIMIT. So it's actually very nice that they complement that set and they're publicly available. You can order them to study and to so on, to make crosses with them. So that, that's all there free for anyone to use. 
So, Cristobal, you've been a great leader in wheat uh, for a long time. What are your next steps and what are you planning on? What's your next big adventure? Next big adventure. Well, we're doing a lot of work on the haplotypes. We're quite excited with that. Um, we're also quite excited with the prospect that the UK might move towards gene editing. And if it goes, then that's going to give us a real, um, it's been frustrating that we can't use all the tools in the toolbox. It's not that it's going to be only about gene editing, but gene editing offers a really uh, nice way. And for me, it's important because it means that our discoveries can go faster to the field. And for me, that's great because I can make the triple mutants, but then if I then need to back cross them into elite varieties, that might take another 15 years before they're out. If I can do it directly in the elite variety, that goes out within years, within two or three years. So I think for me, the most exciting part now would be to take advantage of these tools. And especially if we have genome editing as a viable way to the field in the UK, uh, that's going to be a game changer in terms of the motivation and, and what we can do for farmers. Great. So thank you very much for a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I know we didn't get a chance to answer all of the questions that came in, but each of those questions will be uh, responded to subsequent to the webinar. Uh, just a reminder, the webinar has been recorded and you can see, will be able to see this on the IWGSC YouTube channel. Again, thank you, Christopher, for a great presentation and look forward to seeing everyone on our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.